this service, and we'll praise you for what's accomplished. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Greg, and thank you for being here tonight. How many of you ever remember the television show called Candid Camera? Remember that? They would play jokes on people, and all of a sudden they would tell them, okay, it's really a joke, and then they would say, smile, you're on Candid Camera. So I've not come tonight to play any jokes on you, but you are on Candid Camera, okay? Okay. <laughs> I went home and uh, the last time I preached and watched the, the sermon, wanted to, you know, kind of see how my mannerisms are in the pulpit or whatever and see if I had bad diction or bad voice clutter. And that camera would pan on the audience and some of you were not smiling. And some of you looked like you had a hard day. And I said, God, if I have uh, spoken your word and, and not spoken it in the proper way and it's made people sleepy... I, I, I confess my sin of that, okay? Uh, so just remember you on candid camera. I'll tell you like I tell my senior class, just sit up and, and smile and we'll, we'll have a good time. I'm probably going to be a little bit hyper tonight. I am not wanting to talk about me and I'm not wanting to do anything that would take away from the Word of God, but I'm on some medicine for my back. Uh, I have two herniated discs in my back and they put me on steroids. I feel like I got a suntan on my face, I'm flush, and I'm a little bit, little bit hyper. So if I start running around, you can say, boy, he's on the medicine or the Holy Spirit got a hold of him, okay? One of the two. I do remember one night we had a pastor. He was preaching in a revival service, and he got real excited, and he ran, and he jumped up, and this was when the, the, uh, the stage here was a little bit lower, and the, the choir thing was back here. He ran and jumped all the way up on that thing. And he kept preaching, running up and down that thing. And then he, he ran down here and jumped up on the front pew and he kept preaching. And everybody was saying, man, man, that's good preaching, preacher. That's good preaching. And I don't know how your mind works, but after that man did that, I never heard another word he said. Because I was thinking, how in the world can a preacher jump that high? And how in the world can a preacher run down the steps and jump on that, on that pew? And if I did that tonight, some of you are going to have to help me, okay? There's no way I could, could do that. But boy, what a great season we're in as a church. Can you say amen to that? I tell you, the Lord has really been working. We are in a season of resurrection. Let me encourage you to continue to fast and pray and just anticipate a great day here of worship on Sunday as we celebrate our resurrected Savior, Jesus God is moving, and I've been praying fresh wind, fresh fire through the Holy Spirit. And, and let me encourage you to continue to live a cross-centered life. Let me encourage you to continue to focus on Jesus. And what an amazing job, Pastor Eric, and what an amazing job Pastor Chris has done for us with those seven sayings from the cross as our Lord Jesus Christ himself spoke as he was being crucified. I'm telling you, if you will focus on those seven sayings and if you will, will find what the Holy Spirit wants you to do with those seven sayings in your own life, you're going to be transformed, I do believe, during this Easter season. Let me also suggest to you that during these days, you can live in anticipation of a soon coming Jesus, coming to rapture his church, coming to call his people into heaven with him. And we can live in anticipation of that. Now, I, I don't want you to, to get caught up in all this stuff that goes on in videos, how these people get on TV and, and they, they start using numbers and they multiply all these numbers by other numbers and they give you the date Jesus is going to return. I'll just remind you that one day with God is as a thousand years. When could Jesus come back? Well, uh, John talks about and Paul talked about the return of Jesus is imminent. You know what that means? It can happen at any moment. So we can live in anticipation of that, but we don't have to play a bunch of games. Matter of fact, I believe if we play a bunch of games with people, we make ourselves look not very smart. And so what I would do during these days as we anticipate the coming rapture of the church, I would work and I would wait, and I would witness. That's what I would be doing. So let me give you that tonight as well. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 
27. Matthew chapter 27. We're just going to look at maybe one verse tonight, maybe a few verses ahead of that. I want to talk to you tonight about a Roman centurion and a crucified Savior. How many of you have ever served in the military? Can I see your hand? Thank you. Let me say thank you, first of all, for your service to this great country and your willingness to perhaps risk your life so all of us could have our freedoms that this great country offers. I do not take those for granted, and I do not take you for granted. So with a heartfelt thanks, I submit that to you. But if you've ever served in the military... You understand what a commanding officer is, do you not? Perhaps it was a drill sergeant who told you what to do and when to do it. Perhaps it was a lieutenant or a colonel that came by and you were required to stop and salute that person. How many of you have ever worked a job? Yeah, most of us have worked a job. We understand that when we work a job, there's going to be someone in command. And we're going to understand, we're going to have to answer to someone who is in authority. How many of you are married? Guys, gentlemen, we know who to answer to, do we not? (laughs) The one in charge, the commanding officer, the chief financial officer, the wife. It is so funny to me when these young couples come to me and they ask me, would I be willing to officiate their wedding? And I say, yes, but... There are some things I would like to do before I do that. I would like to meet with you and talk to you. I'd like for you to help me plan your own ceremony. And I have some books and we'll take out the books and work on the wording. And then I give them some advice scripturally, what the Bible says about being married. And then it never fails the groom-to-be. The young man always looks at me and says, Mr. Potter, I just really don't know what's going on. And I tell him every time, don't worry about it. She does. And she's in command. And all you and I have to do on the day is to show up when we're supposed to show up and do what the bride-to-be says has to be done, and you will be fine. And you can see the relief on their face when I tell them that. Well, I think with that in mind, you all can understand what the Roman centurion was all about and who he was. He was a commanding officer serving in the Roman military, and he was in charge of 100 soldiers, which would be called a legion. And concerning the crucifixion of Jesus, we meet a Roman centurion who was there that day, and not only was he there, he was in charge. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those three Gospels record about this Roman centurion being there and also being in charge. Now, we don't know how many of his soldiers were there. We do know there were a group of them because we're going to read in just a moment that, and it says something about, and those that were there. Uh, We get a glimpse in the scriptures tonight of what they did. It was this one centurion who would have took charge of the execution of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in charge of the events of the crucifixion according to Roman law. It was he who would have given the orders to the soldiers to strike Jesus, to hit Jesus. It was he who would have been given the orders to bring the crosses and prepare the crosses and prepare the ground. It was he who would have been given the order to tie the prisoners and then nail them to their cross. It was this centurion who would have said, take the one called Jesus And place his cross in the middle. And then place a crown of thorns on his head. Because it is he who says he is a king. It is this centurion who would have said. Placed a subscription above his head. Which says king of the Jews. Four of the gospels record Roman soldiers. Who were under the cross cast lots for the tunic. That belonged to the Lord Jesus. Now. We understand the centurion. We understand the soldiers that were there. We know, looking back, they were fulfilling a prophecy. Now, I don't think in that moment they understood that. But we can look back and say, you know what? Before the foundation of the earth, this is how God planned it. And God knew every person that would be there on that day. 
And God knew every role that they would play concerning His plan. His plan of, God's plan of crucifixion. What were they doing? What were they doing? Just carrying out what? Carrying out their orders from their governor, Pilate. They were crucifying Jesus. And and as they were crucifying Jesus, and as He's hanging on that cross for those hours, many of those soldiers would have been in close enough proximity that day to hear what Jesus said. And I believe when when they heard these words, I believe it, it touched their spirit when he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And remember, they were the ones beating him. They were the ones crucifying him. I believe it would have touched their emotions when he looked and said, Son, behold your mother. I believe it would have given them a sense of sorrow when they heard Jesus say, My God, why have you forsaken me? And and really when he said, I thirst, it elicited in them a human response because they offered him something to drink. And when he said, it is finished, Father, I commit my spirit into your hands, I believe they begin to pay close attention to those words. The Gospel of John records that when Jesus took his final breath, one of the soldiers took a spear and he plunged it into the side of the Lord Jesus. Now, we don't know what that was about. I've heard pastors speculate that he was an ill-natured soldier just trying to do extra damage. I thought perhaps it was just to release the extra fluid that had built up in Jesus' body, in his chest cavity and in in his stomach cavity, just to release the extra fluid just so his body would go more limp so they could take him down from the cross. How much did they hear? We can only wonder. But as we read tonight in chapter 27, verse 54 of Matthew, I want you to understand that in that moment, something amazing happened. Chapter 27, verse 54. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe. I believe the King James Version says fear and said, truly, This was the Son of God. Shall we pray? Father, bless the reading of your word tonight. I pray, God, it would pierce our hearts and pierce our souls. May your word accomplish your perfect will for our lives tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to spend some time this evening looking at this centurion, this Greek, this Roman soldier. And I want us to understand that in the moment of his life that we are reading about, he began to recognize who Jesus is. He began to feel something well up in his spirit, well up in his soul, and well up in his mind, and he is now open to the truth. Look back at his saying, truly, truly. That's an interesting word used there. As a matter of fact, it's the same Greek word that Jesus used to describe himself when he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. It's the same word Jesus used when he said, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Set you free. It's the same word. So what do we know about this centurion tonight? I want to give you three things. I think number one, we can see this centurion had a perception of who Jesus was. He had a perception of who Jesus was. He had felt the earth quake. Matter of fact, if you go back to verse 52, he saw something pretty amazing. Because when the earth began to quake and the graves began to open, the Bible said some of those saints who had died came forth and began to walk around. He saw the dead brought back to life. So man, he got some perception, did he not? His eyes were seeing some things, and his ears were hearing some things. What had he heard? He'd heard the words of Christ as he was dying on the cross. He heard the jeers from the Jews when they hollered, crucify him, crucify him. He also heard the sobs from Jesus' family and his friends as they watched him die. He saw the tears on their face. We don't know, but perhaps this could have been the same centurion that Luke records about 
who was in Capernaum, and I read that was only about a day's walk over to Jerusalem. Could have been the same centurion, we don't know. But I can tell you, the centurion in Luke went through really the same process. He had a perception of who Jesus was because the Bible says in Luke that this centurion had a servant who had taken sick and the Bible said he had heard about Jesus and he sent for Jesus and he said, Jesus, you don't even have to come. All you have to do is speak the word and my servant will be healed. And Luke records that Jesus looked around at all those people following him and he said, I have not seen such great faith even in Israel. Perhaps this is the same centurion. We don't know. But I understand what perception is, don't you? Perception is simply this. It is an understanding of something and it is a knowledge of something welling up in your mind. Your brain and your mind begin to activate and you begin to think about what you have seen and what you have heard. That's what perception is. Uh, your eyes and your ears. The centurion had heard of Jesus. The centurion at the cross, he'd seen all the events. He heard the words. And what did he say? Truly, truly this man is the Son of God. I want to share this with you tonight. If you're here tonight and you're saved, if you're here tonight and you're born again, if you're here tonight and you've come to faith in Jesus, do you know what? You had to have a perception of who Jesus is. You really did. At some point in your life, you begin to have a mental knowledge of who Christ is. You begin to have a mental knowledge of, of the whole story of Jesus and the whole story of his gospel. Perhaps someone shared that with you. Perhaps it was a Sunday school teacher. Perhaps it was a pastor. Perhaps it was a, a friend who told you who Jesus was. Somebody gave you a perception, maybe a parent, reading the story of, of Jesus when you were a little boy, a little girl. I tell you one thing, I can remember every Sunday school teacher I ever had when I was a little boy. I remember one in particular. I was six years old. Her name is Ann Baker. And she had the six and seven year old boys class over in the Paramore building. And for some reason, and I think I know why now, Ann Baker was fascinated with Jesus on the cross. <laughs> she had those flannel boards. Most of us know what a flannel board is. And I don't care if she was talking about Jonah in the well. I don't care if she was talking about three men in a lion's den. She would stop in the middle of that lesson and say, hold on, boys, I forgot to share it with you. I got to tell you this. And she would take that little cross and she would stick it on that flannel board. And she would say, this is the cross of Christ. And we'd all take notice. We all begin to look and we all begin to hear. And then she would take Jesus and she would say, and Jesus died on the cross so you boys might have forgiveness of sin. And we'd all jeer and we'd all clap. And boy, it felt so good to me for somebody to tell me about Jesus. Even as a seven, six, six and seven year old boy, she was planning in my head a mental knowledge of who Jesus was. That's what you call perception. Let me also submit to you tonight, you know what, church? You cannot be saved simply by a head knowledge of Jesus Christ. It takes a little more than that. Now, I think that's an important step, and I think that Roman centurion, he took those steps. He knew who Jesus was. He'd been around that community for three years when Jesus was preaching and teaching. He'd seen all the miracles. He had a perception. Number two, this centurion was persuaded by the Holy Spirit. Go back with me to verse 54. I want you to see tonight that he makes a voluntary confession of the Christian faith. Truly, this is the Son of God. Paul told the church at Rome, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that Jesus is Lord, you will be what? Saved. Jesus said no one comes to the Father unless they are drawn by the Spirit now, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, works in many mysterious ways. But I do know this, He works. He works. If you're here tonight, you're watching online, perhaps, you've never come to faith in Jesus, I'm praying tonight that the Holy Spirit will begin to 
persuade you with the truth of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? Jesus died on the cross to save sinners. Jesus died on the cross so you and I might have our sins forgiven. Jesus died on the cross so you and I could be put back into a right relationship with God, our Father, our Creator. Do you, do you remember that? Those of you who are saved, do you remember that? Do you remember the persuasion of the Holy Spirit? You can't get away from the Holy Spirit, can you? You can't run, you can't hide. I used to put my head under my pillow and say, Spirit of God, leave me alone. And guess what? He kept coming. He kept coming. And he kept coming till I dropped down on my knees and I surrendered and I said, Jesus, you are my Savior. I believe in you. You think about that. Boy, that's some, uh, that's some persuasion now. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Uh, here's what he began to speak to me about. He began to speak to me about my sin of unbelief. And he began to speak to me about, you know what? If you were to die in the state that you're in right now, you would spend eternity separated from God and you would go through the second death and you would never be able to get to God. But Jesus died on the cross and you don't have to experience the second death. I'm here to tell you tonight, I'm born again. I'm saved. I've accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. I hope you have. And I know you have. Were you afraid when it happened? I can't re remember really being in fear. I was sort of in fear of the second death that I might experience. I was thinking about my sin of unbelief. Well, the Bible says the centurion and those around him, guess what? They were afraid. Now, I believe the Holy Spirit can use fear as well. And I'm not here to try to scare anybody. I don't play emotional games with anybody I witness to. I just tell them the truth. And that's what we need to do. But you know what? It was a little bit different experience for this centurion than it was me. I didn't feel the earth shake. I didn't see the dead come back to life. The Bible said he was afraid. Oh my, he was afraid. You know what the Bible says here? It says that in this moment, that Roman centurion, I believe, as he looked up at Jesus and then he looked at the top of his boots and he saw blood spatter coming on the top of his boots because he was standing right under that cross. I believed in that moment he realized, you know what? The blood that falls on my boots tonight forgives my sins. Wow. Just think about that. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Persuasion, what is that? It, it is simply this, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. I believe tonight that there are too many people even right here in our community who are almost persuaded. You do a little study here in eastern North Carolina. You go out and, and you can ask people all up and down in the community, hey, hey, sir, can I have a moment of your time? Do you know who Jesus is? What's the answer going to be here in the Bible Belt? The answer is going to be yes. Do you know who Jesus is? Why, sure I know who Jesus is. I learned about him in Sunday school. Second question, have you ever accepted him as your personal Savior? Well, I really don't know about that. Well, you know what they are? They're almost persuaded. The Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has to reveal truth to you for you to be saved. I remember the song when I was growing up in church here. They would come to the piano at the end of the service and preacher Paramore would say, everyone stand. And I'm going to pray a prayer of invitation. And if you feel the Holy Spirit convicting you, we want you to come up front and we'll have someone show you how you can be saved. Here's the song. Here's the song. Listen closely to the words. Almost persuaded now to believe. Almost persuade, go thy way. On some more convenient day, on the need to pe have people almost persuaded. It is our job as, as his followers to persuade them. The story is I read the centurion who was persuaded, but I'm in that courtroom, and he's pleading his case, but is standing in that room, and he is before Paul. And Paul gets through delivering the gospel. Words I do know, he said. He looked at Paul, a Christian, almost persuaded. And then finally tonight, we see the centurion's performance. Now, don't get too excited about that word. 
What, what is that? What am I trying to, to draw for you here with this word, his performance? It's very simple. He confessed and he believed. That, that's it. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you have your Bible, turn over to Romans chapter 9 and let me show you how it happens today. And this is how it happened to the centurion except one little minor point that he had to look three days forward to that we look back on. Romans chapter 10, I meant to say, verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches. What does that mean? His free gifts on all who call on him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, say it with me, shall be saved. Judas. Judas betrayed him. The Jews mocked him. And the Jews turned him over to Pilate. And Pilate looked at them, and, and it was customary to release one prisoner. And Pilate looked at them and said, Whom should I release, Barabbas or Jesus? And the Jews began to say, Give us Barabbas. And Pilate looked at that crowd and said, Well, what would you have me do to Jesus? And with Jesus, and they begin to shout, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And then Pilate gives the orders, and remember who carried out the orders, the Roman centurion. He was in charge of everything that day. He carries out the orders, and, and then he hears Jesus cry out, it is finished. And in that moment, the, the soul of Jesus has departed from his body, <laughs> And the Roman centurion, Matthew says, and those with him make their confession of faith when they say, truly, this man is the Son of God. And I believe the words of Jesus rang out to them and the words of Matthew rang out in their head. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not what? Perish but have everlasting life. Because God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And whosoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the Son of God. I am so thankful that Roman centurion made his statement of faith. I am so thankful that one day I made my statement of faith. And if you're here tonight and you made your statement of faith, I am so thankful. That makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to submit to you tonight, church, heaven's going to be a full place. Heaven's going to be full. I would also submit to you tonight, there's plenty of room left. Amen? Plenty of room left in heaven. It is, it, God's expanse is, is, is eternal. And so what, is, what are we to do? What are we to do? We are to look at the one who carried out the crucifixion orders and we are to take note of his statement of faith. And then we are to realize this, and you can go back and read Romans chapter 9. We must realize this, God can save anyone. And God can save whoever he chooses to. And so I want you to think about that. Now, it's all the same method of salvation, okay? Okay. But you know what? It's under many different circumstances. A Roman centurion gets saved. What was your circumstance? I love to hear testimonies. I wish we had time tonight to go all the way around the room and let everybody give a testimony about your salvation experience. It may have been riding in your car somewhere. It may have been in a church service somewhere. It may have been in your bedroom. I remember falling on my knees in my bedroom and saying, Oh God, save my wretched soul. I don't know your story. I'd love to hear it one day. But you know what? The Jews rejected him, and here we have the Roman soldiers accepting him. How about you tonight? Have you said in your heart, Jesus is the Son of God? Have you said in your heart, Jesus is one with God? Or do you simply have a head knowledge? Think about making a statement of faith. 
and accepting your free gift of salvation. Ephesians says it is nothing more than a free gift, and all we have to do is not work for it. We, just simp- we don't pay for it. Jesus paid for it, did he not? All we have to do is accept it. I read the story of Teddy Roosevelt as he was leading his Rough Riders to battle. They had been injured and and they hadn't had food for a few days and they needed medical supplies. So Roosevelt went over to a lady named Clara Barton. You'll recognize her as the founder, I do believe, of the Red Cross. And he says, Miss Barton, I need food. I need to buy as much food as you can sell me. And I need to buy as much medicine as you can sell me. I need to buy medical supplies for my men. They're really wounded. And Clara Barton looked at him and said, Sir, it's not for sale. And so he turned around. He was dejected and he went back to his men. And he said, Men, Clara Barton tells me that food and medical supplies from her are not for sale. And they looked at Mr. Roosevelt and they said, Sir, go back and ask for it because she'll give it to you. (laughs) That's the way God is, is it not? He'll give you your salvation. All you have to do tonight is ask. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight for your cross. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for that price that you paid. And Lord, on that cross, what were you doing? You gave amazing grace. We thank you, God, for that love. We thank you even, Lord Jesus. And now we get to experience forgiveness and the embrace of God our Father. Learn about Jesus and then we're persuaded by the Holy Spirit and then we simply reach out for our faith journey to, Lord, be a a spokesperson, to be an ambassador in God. We look forward to the rapture when Jesus will come in the clouds and call us to be with him and there shall we ever be. Wherefore, let us tonight comfort one another with those words. And we pray these things in the name of Christ, our lovely crucified Savior, soon coming Savior, in his name, amen and amen. Well, let me remind you of our Easter service on Sunday morning right here in the main sanctuary at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you then, looking forward to a great Easter. May the Lord bless you and you are dismissed.